Central rivals go head-to-head -head this weekend when the Pirates face the Cubs at Wrigley. It's swing and a miss. He stuck him out. The pregame at 3 Eastern, first pitch at 4, Saturday on ESPN Radio and the new ESPN app. Hi, Dari Noka in for Paul. Coming up on the best of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast, will former Notre Dame quarterback Everett Golson transfer to South Carolina? And does Steve Spurrier even want him? New Florida basketball coach Mike White joins me and why something may happen in SEC football that's happened only once in 25 years. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. As for gold, we've talked uh, ad nauseum. We did it Friday. It's been done over the weekend about why he may or may not end up in the Southeastern Conference and that there is a bylaw in this league in the SEC that says if you've essentially, I'll, I'll paraphrase the part of this that's pertinent, if you've had academic punishment, okay, it also says or athletic department punishment, there are some exceptions there, but academic punishment from your previous school, even if you're in good standing when you leave that school, then you have to be cleared, granted a waiver to get into the SEC. Well, that's obviously Everett Colson's situation. He was kicked out of Notre Dame or suspended from Notre Dame I should say, for cheating, now, academic cheating. He missed the entire 2013 year. But now he's leaving Notre Dame, and he's been granted. He, he can't transfer anywhere that Notre Dame, uh, of a team that they play this coming season, which really, of all of the possibilities, really only knocks out Texas. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, other uh, certain Big Ten schools were – likely destinations, but Texas might have been one. So according to that policy, that waiver that he got from Notre Dame, he can't go there. But there's this waiver within the SEC that's going to have to be sorted out somewhere at the league office in Birmingham, I'm assuming, if he's going to end up at, oh, I don't know, South Carolina, where he's from, Georgia, where uh, there are indications that he would like to go. And it's going to come down to whether, I think the thought typically has been, Mike Slide, the SEC commissioner, who of course has his last day as commissioner on July 31st, is willing to waive that stipulation and allow Golson to come into the Southeastern Conference. What I can't really figure out, although I'm kind of gaining a hunch on this, is, is this Slide's decision entirely, or does he go to Greg Sankey and say, you know what, starting August 1st, this baby is yours, and by this baby, I mean this conference, you're the commissioner. Do you want this to be something that you allow moving forward? Because if we allow it for Everett Golson, we're going to have to allow it for anybody else who has their degree in hand, whether or not they've had an academic issue at another institution. They want to come in, you're going to have to be able to open the doors for them. Are you okay with that? And I'm curious as to whether that is a conversation taking place. My gut tells me it is. I think Greg Sankey is very much going to be involved in whether or not a player like Golson is allowed in this league. Mike Slive is incredibly successful. He's incredibly proud, and he's incredibly intelligent and, I think, sensitive to what he is leaving behind and those that he is leaving it in the hands of. He's leaving it in Greg Sankey's hands. And if I think, if Greg Sankey says, you know what? You know what, Mike? I I, I think this is good for the league. I really do. I, I think it shows that we're giving somebody a second chance. I think that it's good for the football in this conference. I'm okay with this if you want to go ahead and let him in. I kind of think he might let him in. But if Greg Sankey says, you know what, what you've done is great, and this, this law that you put into place is great, and I don't want to mess with it, and I don't want to change it, then I think Mike Slive may say no. So given that, what I've just told you, I believe, I think it's as much, if not more, in the hands of Greg Sankey, though he's not commissioner until August 1st, as it would be in the hands of Mike Slive. I also, uh, and by the way, you can feel free to jump in on this any time. Again, 855-242-7285. Uh, and if, if, you, if you have a, let's go and jump into this real quick. Trip is in Jackson, Mississippi here. Uh, Trip, what are you thinking? Hey, Dory, how you doing? I'm good. Thank you. I'm thinking that whatever SEC school forks up the most cash is the one that would get Golston, kind of like the Cam Newton situation when he was, uh, trying to get money from Mississippi State, ended up going to Auburn, got cleared of all the 
you know, charges, but still, I think we all know what happened there. Well, that, and that's all speculative, and that stuff that's been, you know, Trip. I, I realize, like that stuff, that stuff's been out there. It was out there in 2010. Uh, it's been out there. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, an investigation was done. Uh, Auburn came out okay in that. Gene Chizik came out okay in that. I'm not going to dive into what uh, some feel might have happened there to get Cam Newton to Auburn. I know that. I do know this as well. Uh, this just came down. Uh, Kubiak just sent it to me here, one of our producers on the TV side. And uh, According to 24-7 Sports, the front runner for Everett Golson is... Florida State, not really a surprise, uh, according to 24-7 Sports, uh, that uh, multiple sources with intimate knowledge of Golson's situation tell them that it would be Florida State. And they say, quote, barring a last-minute change of heart or any influence from elsewhere, Florida State's where he's headed. Now, if that happens, does not impact this league, would we ever know if the stipulation uh, of needing a waiver from the SEC is a reason he would not end up in the SEC. Again, this is a report. Not saying it's fact. This is what they're reporting. They also at one point reported that today would be a day he'd be at South Carolina. And it doesn't appear that that's happening. So, you know, you take this for what it is. Uh, but if he goes to Florida State, then he goes to Florida State. And, and they certainly improve at the position. We saw, saw what Sean McGuire uh, did in the start that he had uh, last year against, who was it, Clemson, I believe. And they were very fortunate to get a win. So there's that. If any more information comes available, we'll get it. Don't forget, Josh Kendall of the state in Columbia going to join us here in about five minutes and, and tell us uh, what he knows uh, from the South Carolina perspective. I want to jump in with something else here. Uh, I woke up this morning, and we always, you know, we're doing this show. We kind of think about what can we do? What's an angle we can go? There's nothing out there, obviously, outside of Golson that's jumping out to us. But, you know, you see these... Well, they really started in January, and then after signing day in February, Mark Schleyball had one. The way too early top 25 for next year. And Ohio State getting the vast majority of the votes. Uh, TCU uh, getting, uh, they're going to get a, a, a pretty good chunk of the votes as well. Could it be that something happens in the preseason poll in the AP when it comes out in August that has not happened but one time since 1989. Only one time in the last 25 years has it happened where in the preseason AP poll there was not an SEC team garnering a first-place vote. That none of the 60 or so voters put an SEC team at number one in their individual ballot. The only time it's happened since 1989 was in 2005, when USC had 60 of the then 65 first-place votes in the preseason poll. Texas had four, and though they were ranked 12th overall, Louisville had one. Of course, remember, Texas beat USC in a remarkable game to win the national championship out in Pasadena. That was the only time it's happened that an SEC team did not have a first place vote. I don't think that's out of the question by any stretch of the imagination. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. The big story is wherever Golson's going to go. 24 7 Sports uh, just reporting that the front runners uh, to land Everett Golson uh, are the Seminoles of Florida State, but there's also been hints of interest from Golson in programs like South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, well, let's start with South Carolina. Let's go into that and, and head to Columbia and speak with Josh Kendall of the state uh, down there in, in Columbia. There were reports, Josh, from 24-7 that, that he was going to be in Columbia today. Uh, do you know anything about a potential visit, whether it's today or down the road, between uh, uh, Golson and the Gamecock staff? No, I don't. And he may, he may visit, he may not. But I know that in this situation... As in so many of these, as soon as it breaks, you see a lot of people throwing a lot of stuff against the wall. And in this situation, a lot of it has been premature, if not flat wrong. So I, if, if there's a visit to South Carolina, I, I haven't heard about it. doesn't mean it's not happening. But I I agree that the Seminoles are the front runner. I, I, I would say if I had to make an educated guess at this point, it would be Florida State. Yeah, I mean, that certainly makes sense. Uh, uh, for, for his best interest, 
for their best interest. Sean McGuire's not a, a championship caliber quarterback, not by a long shot, at least from what we've seen, unless he's made tremendous strides. Uh, you know, Golson, though, comes in, and he's a, this is a guy that turned it over 22 times last year. And I don't want to take away the great season he had in 2012 when he led them to an undefeated regular season and a spot in the championship game in Miami against Alabama. But, but last year, 22 turnovers. How would Steve Spurrier handle that? <laughs> it might it might literally kill him. Not just not just drive him to retirement. It might kill him. I, in oh. all seriousness, I can promise you that no Steve Spurrier quarterback would ever turn the ball over twenty two times. He would be sitting in the fifth row well before that happened. <laughs> right. He just, right. He, it, it, it's it's an impossibility. So yeah, absolutely. That is an oil and water mixture. That would just, I mean, it would be great fun for the rest of us, but it might kill Steve Spurrier. All right, so Josh, tell me this thing. Give me a percentage here. Give me a percentage chance that Everett Golson is wearing a Gamecock uniform in the fall. 5%, maybe maybe less. Some crazy things happen. Anything can happen. But, you know, this is a kid who they didn't want when he came out of Myrtle Beach High School. He was right down the road for a long time yeah. and drew no interest from them. And he's got to remember that, for one thing. For another thing, he hated running the zone read at Notre Dame. Well, guess who loves to run the zone read these days? Steve Spurrier in South Carolina. Yeah, there, you're right. There are, just a, there are a lot of reasons it does not make sense. Now, crazy things have happened. Anything can happen. This doesn't feel like one of them. At the where, where does South Carolina sit realistically at the quarterback spot? And, and if he ended up there, is he the automatic number one? I don't think so. I mean, I think he's leaving Notre Dame because he's not the automatic number one right there. Right. He's, not, he's not a guy who fits comfortably into this offense. They do think that Connor Mitch can get the job done, particularly after spring practice. And Connor Mitch is six foot four, looks like an All-American, threw for literally 12,000 yards in high school. There are a lot of reasons to believe that Connor Mitch can, can get the job done. If At the very least, Everett Golson would have to compete for the starting job here as he would at most places. And I think, you know, if you're looking at it from Everett's perspective, he's got one more shot. He doesn't necessarily want to go compete and roll the dice like uh, Kate Coker in Alabama. That, you know, that didn't work out for him. He wants to walk in somewhere where they at least say, you're a strong number one. And mm -hmm. like we've mentioned, Florida State's got to be telling him at this moment, you're a strong number, you know, number one candidate. Yeah, for the record, in the game against Florida State last year, I think we'll all remember the offensive pass interference against Notre Dame that prevented them from essentially beating Florida State. Golson did play well, 313 yards through the air, 31 of 52, three touchdown passes, did have two of his 14 uh, interceptions uh, in that game, though. Josh Kendall of the state in Columbia joining us here, Dari Noka in for Paul. Uh, one last thing here, South Carolina comes into the season – with as low of an expectation level as it's had in at least, I don't know, Josh, what, a decade or, or more than that even. How are yeah, they At least the 08-09 yeah. region. Okay, all right, so a little less than a decade. How, what's the mood there on campus within that football program? What did you see over the spring? Well, Steve Spurrier's mood is, is pretty good. Uh, for, for one thing, he likes low expectations. He would, he would rather go into the season, pre, you know, preseason AP number 29 than number two. I'm convinced of that. He just <laughs> operates better that way, taking a kind of a guys that you don't think, you know, weren't as highly recruited as your guys and going and trying to beat your number one recruiting class, as we've seen with all the kind of the Nick Saban recruiting barbs. He's, he's very comfortable in that space. But he's, he's energized. You know, last year was tough on him from a defensive standpoint, but he feels like it's going to be better. Now, every college coach in the country is pretty energized in May. We're just going to have to see when August and September get here. You know, it could be another tough season on him if it doesn't go well and, and his mood will be different. Right now, at the moment, inside the football building, they feel pretty good. Josh, great stuff. You say 5% or less, Golson's wearing uh, garnet and black this fall, correct? That's, that's what I say today. Call me back tomorrow. Maybe it'll change, but I'm going to set the 5% for now. All right, Josh, good talking to you. Thanks, Dar. Right, Josh Kittle of the state there, 5% or less. Uh, the Golson is a game cock. James in Indianapolis. Good afternoon, James. Hey, Dari, how you doing? I'm really good, thank you. That's good. So I was just, I just wanted to say, you know, I just, I'm a, I'm a big South Carolina fan. My fiance goes to the uh, University of South Carolina. Um, 
but also being here, I'm out in Indianapolis, a big Notre Dame fan as well, and I'd love to see Everett Golson out there. I mean, he just, he just, I mean, we had all those years in South Carolina with uh, Connor or Connor Shaw taking us mm-hmm. to all those awesome seasons, at mobile quarterback, and we had Dylan Thompson in there, and it didn't seem like we could do really much anything at all. So I really would love to see Connor or see Everett Golson go out there and do something like Connor Shaw. I don't think Mitch Connor. I understand what Josh is saying, but. I don't think, uh, you know, he's that pro-style quarterback. I don't know if he can do the same things that uh, a mobile guy like Everett Colson could do. All right, so what's your take then on uh, on Josh just telling us less than 5% chance that he ends up there? What do you think of that? Well, you know, like he said, you know, they didn't really pay much attention to him in high school. So, I mean, I, I probably agree with that percentage. I just wish it wasn't so. You know, I, I would love yeah, for yeah. Everett to come here. And I think a lot of, a lot of Gamecocks fans would love that as well. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Lance in Tennessee. Good afternoon, Lance. Hey, Dark. Uh, I got a problem with something you said Friday. You sent Missouri back into the SEC championship. You remember saying that? No, I, I did not say that. Somebody said that I you did. You did say that. You did say that. Did I say they backed into it? I didn't. I didn't yeah, use man. the phrase "backed into it." They benefited. Yeah. They benefited from a very weak schedule. They did not beat a single no, team wait, above five hundred. Pro- hold, hold, right there. Okay. Stop right there. Weak right. schedule. Go. All Georgia had to do was beat Florida. I mean, Georgia Southern made them since Georgia's made them. That's the bottom line right there. But Missouri, right here, at Texas A&M. Texas A&M the week before beat Auburn. At Tennessee. Then they beat Arkansas at home. Tennessee and Arkansas are two of the hardest teams last year at the end of the season. That ain't benefiting from the schedule. At yeah. A&M, at Tennessee, Arkansas at home. I'm a Gator fan, but that really got me hot, man. I'm okay. sick of Georgia fans calling in. Talking about how they got robbed last year. All you had to do was beat the Gators, man. If you couldn't beat Florida last year, you don't deserve to win. And I'm sick of hearing about Nick Chubb. They had Todd Gurley and Nick Chubb last year. What'd that get them? The belt ball, baby. I'm just sick of it, man. Lance, so, Lance, let, me, let me ask you this, Lance. Let me, in, yes, your, in, in your heart of hearts, in your mind, was yes, Missouri one of the two best teams in the SEC last year? They were the best team in the SEC East. Were they one of the two best teams in the SEC last year? Only, let me ask you. Let me. I'll, 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 I'll go back. Hey, no, let, let me no, go back to you. Let no, me go back to the answer no, you just gave me. Were they answer, really the no. best team in the SEC East? Were they really? They were the best team in the SEC. Hey, not East. every time the team that has the best record in conference play is the best team Darn. in that conference order. It Georgia Darn. hammered them, Lance, at their okay. place. Okay, Missouri hammered Florida and, and Florida lost to Indiana. Georgia. Indiana beat Missouri last year. Not. Who cares? Hey, the Bucky's focus on Georgia. They lost at South Carolina. They had the ball on the five-yard line. Even though they got the intentional grounding, they could have made the 25-yard field goal day. If you ain't got the skill or the coach to get it done, that ain't Missouri's problem. And when you go down to J- Jacksonville, after Florida just got beat down by Missouri, no hope. Coming in with Treon Harris as the quarterback, mm-hmm. they attempted eight passes in that game. Eight passes. They, everybody in the stadium knew they were going to run it. Georgia couldn't stop it. They ran for over 400 yards. And I, come on, man. And that Georgia same, and that same, go. that same, to go no. when that happens. That when same, that happens, you don't deserve to right. go. Look. That's a terrible loss, okay? I agree okay. with you. That's okay. a terrible loss. I'll also say this. That Florida team that you're bashing, Missouri gained 119 yards against them. They got incredibly fortunate to win that football game, gaining 119 yards. Look, I don't want to say Missouri's not good. Me? I have, you Lance, I have, Lance, I have I'm a full a respect. Fan. Lance, I have full respect for Missouri. I'm just sitting here telling you that because a team wins a division doesn't mean that they are the best team in that division. The best team in a division in the SEC, they didn't beat a single team that was over 500 last year in the regular season. They did Sorry. not do it. Yes. Sorry. I don't care about Missouri. I'm a Gator fan. I'm just telling you. You, you made it about Georgia. Missouri. If Georgia, if Georgia cannot do what they did, if they can't win that schedule, they don't deserve to be there. It don't matter about Missouri. That's all I'm saying, and I'm a dog Gator fan. Missouri went in there and knocked them out, son. Everybody got fortunate to play Florida last year. You know why? Because Jeff Driscoll was the quarterback, and he turned the ball over. Everybody. What they On that four-game losing streak, they turned the ball over 15 times. Everybody got fortunate when you play Gators in that stretch. So don't just sound like Missouri got fortunate. No. They're just pathetic, man. And all I keep hearing about Nick Chubb. They had Todd Gurley and Nick Chubb. What'd that get them? The belt ball. 
That's all I'm saying, man. I'm not right. mad at you, man. But seriously, man, this Georgia prep and love is ridiculous. Brand new offensive coordinators, no wide receivers, no quarterback. Jeremy Pruitt's overrated, and y'all want to act like they're the favorite this year? Who Give me a break, this? man. Who if you this? ain't a gator, you're a gator bait. And Dale, get you a hot cup of shut up, boy. We don't want to hear from you, cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It ain't about Missouri. You started the whole conversation about Missouri. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Here we go. Larry in Shelby. Hello, Larry. Hey, man. What's up? Well, not much. What do you got? Well, I got really P.O.'d, man. I'm listening. Who gives a rat but who's number one or who's number 20? It's at the end of the season, Jack. I mean, it's like Bama. That's everybody got us, Yeah, everybody okay. got us under a microscope. Tell us how our team is. Let me tell you how Bama is. We've got, we don't have freshmen coming back in the second day. They were freshmen last year. Mm-hmm. We got a defense will eat your lunch, Jack. They will put a RKO on that ass. And we got running backs. We got receivers. Yeah, we hurting a quarterback, maybe. But to take a transfer, that is like treason. I don't agree with it. If you take one, you should have better, done a better job coaching. Mm. And I'm going to, yeah. Okay, yeah. I know I'm with you. You wouldn't want Golson even yeah. if he said he wanted to go there. I, I don't want Gold on, and I don't want that Yankee ass, whatever his name is. So, uh, <laughs> I'm just mad. What's his name? Uh, I Oh, Braxton, Braxton Miller, State. Ohio State. Yeah, Braxton Miller. Yeah, right. who wants him? Look at who they played, man. No wonder his numbers is big. I mean, they played like Woodlawn High School, Banks High School. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, I could go out there and have numbers like that. Darren, couldn't you? Uh, no, I couldn't. No, no, yeah, I'm 5'8 and a buck 65. I got no shot. Yeah. But, you know, and, and Looney, <laughs> Looney Lance. You know, Lance, be relevant when you call. You say in Florida, Missouri beat Florida. Who didn't beat Florida? Damn, tell us what game Florida won, and you wouldn't have to tell us for what, two games? Well, he, he was all over Georgia, I remember, yeah. Yeah, they're terrible. And I, I'm just going to say it, man. Uh, we are, I, every team has, when they recruit, because they lose players, Auburn lost players. They are replacing them. But Bama's, they're going to be fine. But I will say this, that Lance, Looney Lance, and Doofy Darrell, and La La La, Missouri, worry about your own team, too. Because if Lance thinks Florida's going to be relevant, he's out of his mind. Get you a hot cup of shut up, boy. We don't want to hit from you, Shut your mouth, Lance. And bought it. Let me tell you something. Hey, one thing you need to chomp on, Jack, and I got it for you. A loony Lance. You go ahead and tell me about Florida, Rose. You always go back to Tebow. Damn, how old is he now? 40? And you keep going back to him. You know? <laughs> Get you a hot cup of shut up, boy. Yeah, you shut up yourself, goofball. I mean, I'm going to tell you something, Lance. I put an RK on that ass. Boom! And knock you plum out, Jack. I wish I'd get a hold of you. You dog Bama one more time. You know, you ain't that hard to find. You'll be the dumbest looking person in Tennessee. You there? <laughs> Hello? All right, Larry. Hey, Larry. Good to hear from you, sir. Yeah, Great to hear from you. All right. Larry and Shelby. Uh, coming up strong there. I, I, I thought he thought my name was Jack. I'm sorry. I, I cut him off there for a moment to uh, correct my name. Uh, Jack. I, I guess we're all Jack. I guess Paul is Jack uh, when when Larry calls, apparently. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Geico presents Strange Saving Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. This 
is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. University of Florida replacing, uh, I would say, what would certainly be considered a legend there in Gainesville, Billy Donovan, off to the NBA to coach the Oklahoma City Thunder after 19 seasons, including two national championships at Florida. Into Gainesville now, Michael White, after four really good seasons and 101 wins at Louisiana Tech. He was announced earlier today officially as the new head coach at the University of Florida, and the coach, Michael White, joins us right now here on the Paul Feinbaum Show. Uh, first off, Coach, let me just ask you, because I plan on speaking to you plenty in your tenure there in Florida, Michael or Mike, because I keep seeing them both. <laughs> uh, either one, Dar. It, it okay. depends what type of mood you're in. All right, perfect. Uh, you have had the opportunity to coach at other spots and by all accounts, other spots in this league uh, over the last few years, you have chosen not to, but you did take Florida. How come? Uh, timing is of the essence, obviously, and uh, timing was a little bit better for my family and I uh, this year as my wife uh, was, was pregnant last spring. That said, um, we were very, very comfortable where we were, Dari. Uh, Louisiana Tech is a special place for the best years of our lives spent there. Uh, and, and it was a tough place to leave. And, and unless something really, really special came about uh, with better timing, uh, we would have been there for a long, long time and may have never left. But the, the brand that is the University of Florida, along with an opportunity to work with, with and for Jeremy Foley and his staff, uh, were, were two huge reasons uh, not to be able to turn this one down and, and really jump at it. So Billy Donovan goes to the Thunder. How long after that did your phone ring and it was Jeremy Foley? Um, after the, uh, the, the press conference that uh, Coach Donovan and, and, and Jeremy uh, conducted, uh, I guess a week ago today, last Monday, mm -hmm. I heard from Jeremy that night. Uh, he asked uh, about my interest, and, and obviously I was really, really excited to, to talk further, to learn more about it. We had several conversations over the next few days, uh, and here we are in Gainesville. What's your biggest challenge in getting this program back to where it was just a few short years ago and even two years ago when it was in the Final Four? Well, I think, I think the biggest challenge uh, really is to um, not pay too much attention to, to all the noise. You know, Coach Donovan did an incredible job of, of taking this thing from it being a good program to, to being a great program. And it wasn't too, uh, too far uh, in the distant past that, that this was one of the best teams in the country, a Final Four team. So um, I know that, that they didn't have their best year last year, but uh, I also know that, that the staff was uh, was working diligently this spring. They had a great spring. We've, we've got a lot of pieces in place. Um, and, and I just hope to continue the progress that's been made around here the last few months. And, and also hopefully we can win a, a few of those close games that um, – that this, this past season we, we came up a little bit uh, short in. I'm asking this one more out of curiosity because I'm just not sure how it traditionally works, and maybe there isn't a, a, a tradition in how it works, but have you or will you uh, speak to uh, Billy Donovan about mm -hmm. the program he has left behind? Well, it, it really um, it, it didn't occur to me to reach out to, to Coach Donovan understanding that he's probably going through what I'm going through right now, and that's and that's a whirlwind. I can't imagine what he's going through up there. Surprisingly, uh, I don't know, three days ago or so, maybe a couple days ago, he he reached out and was very gracious with his time and and energy and information and um, and and with his with his passion, obviously that that he re he relayed about uh, uh, this place and and all the people here that mean so so much to him. And we've ended up having three conversations. Uh, very educational conversations for me, and uh, he is uh, again. He's been very gracious, and, and he'll continue to be a sounding board. And, and I'm very, very appreciative uh, of that. Coach, how do you describe the style of play that we will all see at Florida? Well, I, I really can only speak to the style of play that that uh, we played at Louisiana Tech, and it was it was pretty frenetic. I didn't know what was going on half the time. Uh, we we played really really fast. We we created a, a lot of chaos. We were terrific with with turnover margin and had really good guards that got out in the open floor. Uh, had a really good shot blocker in Mike Kaiser that was kind of the the anchor, if you will, of our defense. Uh, for for me, it's I'd like to play fast here at Florida, and we're going to play fast. To, to what extent we'll see, um, you know, we're going to have to uh, really evaluate what we have and and try to play to our strengths as as any coach would. 
in this conference, uh, and others are the same way, but I know especially here in the SEC, fan bases like to know as much as possible about the men and women leading their sports programs. So, Coach, get us away from basketball. What's Mike White all about? Family. Pretty simple. I'm a very simple, boring guy. It's, it's about uh, hoops uh, or family. If I'm not in the gym, I'm at home hanging out with my wife and kids. I have five kids that are eight and under. Oh. Uh, that I love very, very dearly, and I miss dearly. Uh, and we can't wait to, to get a move down here to Gainesville uh, where we can entrench ourselves in this wonderful community, and really I can get my student-athletes uh, around my family. That's, uh, that's, that's most important to me. Five, eight, and under. I've got three, nine, and under. I can't imagine five, eight, nine. That's a busy house, Coach. I, wow. Yeah, my wife is a saint. <laughs> I'm sure she is. You are coming into a conference where guys like John Calipari, Avery Johnson, Ben Hallen, Rick Barnes, Bruce Pearl are now coaching. What does that mean? It means we have a heck of a conference, a heck of a conference. And, and I said this this morning, Dari, I thought that the SEC, uh, a league that I'm familiar with and, and obviously proud to be back associated with in, in so many different ways, I thought that we, uh, it sounds funny to say that again, but, but we, the SEC, had a great year in basketball this year, and we're really close to having an even better year uh, with the amount of teams that, that could have made the tournament if uh, the ball bounced a, a different way a couple times. And, and with the addition of, of, uh, of more coaches uh, and, and the overall caliber of, of coaching and athleticism and, and talent level in this league, it's an exciting time to be in this league. Uh, it's a great league, and, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. Michael White. Head coach at Florida. Coach, uh, great talking to you. Look forward to when uh, we can do it again. Congratulations again on, on making it to Gainesville. Thanks a lot, Dory. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Let's go to Jamie in Mountain Home, Arkansas. Good afternoon, Jamie. Hey, Dory. How are you? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> I was beginning to think your name was Jack for a while. Yeah, <laughs> so was I. <laughs> <laughs> All these I just years. wanted to talk a little bit about what Larry, uh, these Alabama fans always seem to be just so delusional every year. I think this year, obviously, I don't think SEC is going to have a team in the top one one or two to start the season or at the end of the year. I think mm -hmm. Alabama is always, they're just always delusional this year. And I cannot wait for the meltdown this year for Alabama when they don't make it to the SEC championship game. And I'm calling it right now, Arkansas is going to go to their house and whip their you-know-what, Larry. So put that in your cup, Jack. <laughs> well done, Jamie, from a mountain home, Arkansas. Uh, you know, if you heard me Friday, uh, you know I like Arkansas a lot this year, a lot. Uh, in my mind, their toughest game is that one at Alabama. They also go to Ole Miss. Uh, the schedule's not a walk in the park by any stretch of the imagination. And I don't think he's off his rocker, Jamie, by uh, suggesting they could go to Alabama and win. Because I know this, Arkansas has a lot more back this year than Alabama does. And that was a team that had every opportunity to beat Alabama last year. They left 11 points on the field, dropped an interception on the goal line, and lost by a point. Now, here's Arkansas' schedule. If you uh, are watching us on TV, you can see it. They do go to Tennessee. Not easy. That's October 3rd. Tennessee is a team I know a lot of people are on. I think at the end of the year, they're going to be at their best. I think Arkansas gets them at a good time. At Alabama on the 10th, they are also at LSU. They are also at Ole Miss, Okay. I'm not telling you it's an easy ride, but I remember what they did to LSU last year. I remember what they did to Ole Miss last year, and I think we should keep those things in mind. They are confident. They are experienced. They have, outside of Dak Prescott, I don't know if he's the best quarterback, but he is the guy that comes in with the most valuable experience at the position in Brandon Allen and the best one-two punch at tailback in the SEC. So, uh, and, and I'll, I'll stay firm with that. Henry, Drake, Alabama, I love you. But 
Uh, I will take uh, Williams and Collins or Collins and Williams or whatever order you want to give me them if you are uh, Arkansas. There's no doubt about that. Let's go to Linda in Alabama. Good afternoon, Linda. Hello, Dory. It is. I'm so happy I've got an opportunity to just speak with you today. It's been oh. a few months since I got to talk to you. Well, good to hear from you again. Thank you. Good to hear you, too. I heard you say I, I want to make a comment, and then I want to um, ask you a question, okay? Okay. Um, uh, I heard you say at the top of the show that you're an NBA fan. I am, I am. too. I, I'm, I'm a fan of all sports. So who's your favorite NBA team? Please I'm don't o- play the Cavaliers. No, I'm in Oklahoma. <laughs> it's the Thunder. So my guys aren't even in the playoffs right now, but I I'm still it. enjoying it. I love the Thunder, too. But my <laughs> team, my really my team is the Spurs, and it made me so mad that the Clippers beat them. Oh, my goodness, and they couldn't move on. But it is what it is, you know. Yep. And I guess I'm a delusional Alabama fan, but all I'm going to say is about Alabama, roll tide. <laughs> all right. Linda. And I want to ask you a question. Oh, yes. Yeah, please. Do you know, do you know when um, the uh, college football live is going to kick back in again? You oh, know, when no. it starts? That I don't know. Uh, that's all up in Bristol, and uh, there are people that uh, are a lot smarter than me that make those programming decisions. So I don't know. Uh, when College Football Live will start back up. Linda, good talking to you. Uh, for the record, she mentioned how the Spurs lost to the Clippers. There's not a better team in the NBA at this very moment than the L.A. Clippers, and who would have ever thought, ever thought, that we would say that. Let's go to Bob in Mexico, Missouri. Hello, Bob. Good to talk to you again, sir. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I just wanted to explain a little bit about Friday's call. Uh, after I hung up, you were saying that uh, I was sitting there saying that Missouri was the best team in the East. I never meant that at all. Uh, I know what our warts were, and we were just lucky to get out of there alive last year after the uh, meltdown of our offense. And, and thank, the, thank goodness for Coach Gary Pickle and the staff. They held together long enough. And we were just hoping we could get bowl eligible and not embarrass ourselves. But uh, I, I don't uh, – I you know, appreciate Lance calling and, and picking up the gauntlet, but – but I, I have to agree with you. I don't think that we were the best team in the East. Uh, my, my call was about the uh, Georgia callers. You know, if, if they want to pronounce themselves the inherited best team in the East, then they really need to win those games like South Carolina and Florida. And like they say in the UFC, don't leave it in the referee's hands, you know. Yep. And that, that's what I was trying to get at was that, you know, I, I, I know what, what our, our deal was last year, and I'm very, very aware that, we were lucky to get through the way we did. No, Bob, you you were, and I hate to cut you off. We've got to run. We're up against a hard break that we have one per hour here. Uh, look, again, I will stand by it. You can be the best team and not win your division. Georgia proved that on the field in Columbia last year. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Neil in New Orleans. Good afternoon, Neil. Hi, good afternoon, Dari. Um, I actually am from... I actually go to school at LSU, so in my heart, I want LSU to be number one. Okay. But uh, I see Alabama and Nick Saban's reputation getting him one, maybe two number one votes in the AP poll. And would you agree that if that's the case, that's based on reputation? Yeah, more definitely than based else. on his reputation and based on the fact that he had another number one recruiting class. Right. And that shouldn't be ignored. And it's possible. Even though I would put Auburn as the highest-ranked SEC team at this point, and I'm not going to lie to you, I haven't sat through and looked at every single team and every single schedule, who they play, when they play them, how deep they are at every position, and that's something I'm going to do between now and media days in Hoover in July. But what my gut tells me now is that if I were to rank, a, put together a poll myself, I would have Auburn as the first SEC team I write down. But I do think because of Saban, because of recruiting, because of tradition, and a recent tradition, I think Alabama will be, when it's all said and done, the highest-ranked SEC team. It won't be a one, but if there is an SEC team that's going to get a first-place vote, my hunch is that it will be uh, Alabama. Just my hunch. Chris in Mississippi, good afternoon. How you doing? Great. No, Thank you. 
first of all, I feel you have to get Alabama a first place vote because of who they are, the Crimson Tide. LSU, you know, they got a good program. They should get a first place vote. But out of the the newcomers, I think Arkansas will be a power in the West, and I feel that many people are still overlooking those Bulldogs. They started outside, not even ranked last year, and continued their case to go number one for at least five weeks. And with the return of Zach Prescott, I think he'll be up for the highs and once again, and this year will be a, a year that the dogs will remember undefeated. I said it. Correct it down and mark it in the books. Go dogs. <laughs> I'm not buying it. I'm sorry. With all due respect to Dak Prescott and Dan Mullen, who I love to death, both of them, there gets to be a point where a program, regardless of what they've done the previous year, which by Mississippi State standards, it was incredible last year, simply loses too much to have those expectations pinned to them again, especially when it's not a program that routinely and, and for three or four years running has recruited at a top ten level. You lose a lot, and you're really hoping that the guys that step in give you more than honestly what you may have expected them to give you when you brought them in. I think that's where Mississippi State is right now. Uh, Jared uh, tweeting me, why Auburn? Make your point. Please feel free to state your case. Okay, I will. Offensively, I love Gus Malzahn. I love what he puts into a playbook. I love the way his guys execute it. I have nothing but faith in Jeremy Johnson. I know this is a guy who has started one game in his career, but I'm going to go by what guys like Gene Chizik, who was in the recruitment of Jeremy Johnson, have told me that he is as good as any Alabama, uh, Auburn quarterback they've seen in some time, that he is likely going to get them farther than Nick Marshall, that he is a complete package who can run and throw with great pocket presence and athleticism. That's where I'll start. The scheme Gus Malzahn puts on the field is one that allows for great success running the football regardless of who is carrying the football, okay? Not that they don't have talent there because they do. You've got Duke Williams, who's your top wide receiver in the secondary. I do think they'll miss Sammy Coates, however. Up front, I'm not overly concerned with where Auburn is there. Defensively, it had several breakdowns last season, but it's a, a team that on that side of the football has guys back, and more than anything else, has Will Muschamp leading the charge, an established championship-level defensive coordinator who I think does come in, much like John Chavis will at Texas A&M, and make a very quick turnaround on the defensive side of the football. That said, coaching-wise, personnel-wise, quarterback-wise, I think they are the safest pick in the SEC. I think they are the most complete team in that conference when you put together all of those elements. If that's not my case, I don't have one. That's my case. That's why right now... I would make Auburn the favorite uh, in the SEC. I'm sure you have issues with that. If you do, feel free to uh, go ahead and hit me here. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. ESPN Radio. With the action on the court, the diamond, or the gridiron. Hey! Comes alive. The NBA. The San Antonio Spurs are the world champions. San Francisco Giants are the champions of the baseball world. The new college football playoff. College football playoff national champion, the Ohio State Buckeyes. Your home for the best in sports play-by-play. -play. ESPN Radio. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. You know, we're all tracking the Everett Golson situation. He graduated at Notre Dame so he can transfer and play immediately somewhere else. We know the SEC has the stipulation that indicates that he wouldn't be able to go unless a waiver uh, is granted because of his academic misconduct in 2013 uh, at Notre Dame. So, does that implicate does that cross the SEC off the list? Who knows? 24/7 Sports reporting Florida State is the favorite to land Golson, but there is a huge contingent of people who don't like this rule. They don't think that just because a player graduates, he should be able to go and play somewhere else 
right away. Now, Stuart Mandel of Fox Sports wrote a phenomenal piece on this uh, earlier uh, that I read earlier today. It was posted today, and he uh, joins us right now. Uh, first off, in terms of Golson, Stuart, uh, what are you hearing about him? Well, the reports out there today that FSU is a strong contender uh, mirrors what I've been hearing. I uh, wouldn't be surprised if uh, that's one of the, you know, ends up being on his on his short list. Um, I do think some of the places you've heard about in the SEC are also viable contenders, Georgia being one of those, uh, South Carolina, since it's his home state school. Uh, you know, one thing we haven't found out for sure yet is what restrictions, if any, Notre Dame has put on his list because it, it, it's been uh, rumored. I haven't definitively confirmed one way or the other. Uh, that they might block him from, for instance, Texas, which is Notre Dame's opening up opponent this season, uh, or or maybe some of the Big Ten schools, schools that uh, Notre Dame would consider to be its regional rival. So I do think that the reports about Florida State have a lot of uh, merit to them. In terms of the idea that a, a player can graduate uh, and leave and go play somewhere else uh, right away, and – you know, you, your article gets into this. Some are in favor. Uh, many are not, including, it seems like, the NCAA. Where do they stand on this idea? Yeah, well, we've heard rumblings over the years. You know, this rule has been in place now for almost a decade. Guys like Russell Wilson, most notably, have taken advantage of it. And I've heard over the years various coaches and whatnot who don't like the rule but, but weren't that strong about it. And all of a sudden, I just noticed in the first part of this year, and especially in going to various meetings, conference meetings, college football playoff meetings the last few weeks, that there is suddenly a very strong push to either change or scrap altogether that rule. And it's coming uh, from all levels of, of college athletics, but in particular the NCAA has set up a committee to study all transfer issues. I don't think people in college sports are happy with how many uh, football and men's basketball players transfer during their careers. But they specifically pinpointed this graduate transfer rule. And my article is very opinionated. I feel very strongly that it's a very good rule. If a guy graduates, earns his degree and graduates, he should have the ability to go somewhere else if he thinks that's better for him and play right away. And it's really astounding that we're hearing everybody from major conference commissioners like Bob Bowlesby at the Big 12, Larry Scott at the Pac-12, uh, to, to various coaches and ADs who feel very strongly that this rule is has gotten too far from what it was atten- intended to be in the first place. I thought, Stuart, that what you had in there from uh, David Shaw, Stanford head coach, was was very strong, very compelling. Because I don't think it's just because of of where he coaches, but I think it's just because of who he is and what he's about. He is seems to be one of the smartest <laughs> individuals that you will find uh, in college sports, and he is very much for the continued use of this rule, isn't he? Yeah, David Shaw is very opinionated in general. There, there's very few issues that will come up that he doesn't have a strong opinion on one way or the other. And this is one that he supports, despite the fact it can very easily work against Stanford. Uh, Stanford's a school, obviously, that graduates almost all of its players, and, and in most cases in four years. So they're right to lose players, and they are. Uh, this offseason, they... They did pick up a graduate transfer from Cal, actually, from their arch rival, uh, a defensive lineman. But they've lost four other guys. You know, one of their uh, guys who has started at cornerback for them a lot the last two years, Wayne Lyons, is heading to Michigan. So if anybody would have a, a, a reason to be kicked off about it, it might be him. And no, as he says in the article, kind of what I just said before, he feels uh, if the guy earns his degree, puts in the work in the classroom, and feels there's a better situation for him for that last season, he says he's happy for those guys. Stuart, from everybody that you've talked to uh, over the course of this story and others, what does your gut tell you? Does this get changed to where they are not allowed to transfer after graduating at some point? And if that's the case, how long down the road is that? Yeah, I think at a bare minimum there's going to be some stipulations put on it, whether that's um, that they have to sit out a year first or, or other you know, alternatives. I think they're in the very early stages of discussing it. But I'm curious to see what effect, if any, public backlash will have, because to, to this point, we haven't really covered it. I don't think most of us that cover the sport were aware how far along this was. And I'm not the only one that's written it in the past week. A lot of other national writers who are at these meetings have written similar stories. And you know, usually with NCAA issues, there's people on both sides of the fence. But when 
when I put this article out this morning, every single uh, person who's tweeted back at me or emailed me, it kind of feels the same way I do. So I'll be interested to see how the NCA and the commissioners respond, because knowing that if they do go down this road, they're going to face extreme uh, public backlash, probably more so than most issues that they address. Yeah. Uh, you know what? For the record, I'm, I'm with you. If a young man goes and takes care of his business in the classroom, that is ultimately what is most important, uh, and, and he should have that freedom. Stuart, good talking to you. All right. Thanks so much, Jerry. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Let's go to I-Man. Hello, I-Man. Dory, good afternoon. Same to you, sir. Thank you. You, you know, I guess Paul's got hung up down at the Grove. Anyway, this is your show today. It was his show Thursday. Yours Friday, yours today. Right. You know, I, I love it when the couch potatoes call in and they want to talk to you about the rules, and you understand all that because immediately you cut that caller off and you went to the rules. But I love it when the couch potatoes call in and they try to shape the rules to fit their school, kind of like Nick Saban, you know, kind of, and, and this, this quarterback transfer thing. Nick Saban will probably grandstand in front of the NCAA and say, we get first shot at all transfers if they're worth a flip because we deserve it. I'm Nick Saban. <laughs> I'm the great, you know, he's the shortest guy in the room, but you got, you got, you got to hand it to the little fella with a pink jacket on that demands to be first and then stomps around and has those tirades that he has. I mean, those are just classic. And, and, uh, you know, the, the little fella. But, you know, you're talking about Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson, was it North Carolina State that he yes. left? North Carolina. Yep. All right. North Carolina he went State. To a team. He went to a team. He finished up. He went to a team that had a great offensive line. That's why Cam Newton came to Auburn, bypassed Mississippi State, didn't have anything to do with money or no bag man. He went to the best offensive line in the country from tight end to tackle, senior line, and it proved well for both of them. And then, you know, these kids, when they graduate, they're walking classes and they're, 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 you know, projective art classes and all those kind of things. (laughs) <laughs> and let them go where they want to. They're, you know, in theory, they're not getting paid. Most of them aren't worth a flip anyway. And, and now let's go to the SEC. It's, it's clear to you and, and everybody else that Auburn, Arkansas, Texas A&M, and LSU are going to be the cream of the West and that Missouri and Tennessee are going to be the cream of the crop of the East. And I heard you say earlier, and, and the Georgia fans like calling in saying, well, Missouri was not the best team. You didn't even convince the Missouri guy to call in here and say we were not. You were the best team. You were in the championship game. If Georgia was the best team or Carolina or Florida or anybody else, they would have found a way to win what was in front of them, and they didn't do it. They choked. They choked, and Missouri is by far heads and shoulders above everybody else in the East Division from last year simply because they got to the championship game, and that's what matters. Now, Alabama, of course, they get there, and, and you know, then they go on, and, 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 then, and, and then Urban Meyer put a foot on that neck of the guy with the pink jacket, and their quarterback is now trying not to be a running back. How, does that, how, how do you figure but, but I see that. That's the way they play. That's the way they play up there. Hi, man. Good to hear from you as always. As always. Hey, oh, guess what? And I got a new band. We're looking for a booking agent, and we play the blues, and we're called the Hurt Gems. Have a good day. <laughs> I'm going to say this again, with all due respect to Missouri, who I like. They weren't the best team in the East. They won the East. And they deserve all the respect in the world for that. They may be the best team in the East this year. They weren't last year. That was proven on a football field in Columbia, Missouri, 34 nothing, as they lost to Georgia. I believe Georgia was the best team in the East. But it doesn't matter because Missouri played for the conference championship. That's how it works in sports. There are so many instances where the best team does not play for or win a championship. They might still be able to say, well, we think we're the best team, but you don't have a ring. You don't have the banner. Missouri has the banner. Missouri won the East. They deserve that. But it doesn't mean they were the best team of the seven in the East. 
They are different things. I'm sorry. If you disagree, you disagree. But that's simply where I sit on this. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. With all of the anticipated love for Ohio State and TCU specifically, there is, in my opinion, a very real possibility that for the first time since 2005 and just the second time since 1989, we may have an AP preseason poll without an SEC team getting a first place vote. There's nobody better to go to and find out the real, the, the actual possibility of this happening than the man who is uh, hanging out with us now, my friend Phil Steele, of course, Phil Steele Publications. Uh, you can read his uh, stuff also on ESPN.com. Phil, I mean, you tell me. You put out this this list every year, the anticipated top 25. You you kind of know how these voters vote, you, you and you're very, very accurate when you do it. What's the likelihood that no SEC team gets a top 25 vote in August when that poll comes out? You know, I'm going to give it about a 20% chance. I, I think that 80% uh, chance one team gets voted. Now, the likelihood of one getting voted in the top two, I don't think so. But one vote from one person who falls in love with an Alabama, who falls in love with an Auburn, uh, I, I think that will happen this year. And really, you know, when you're an AP voter, you have to think with an open mind. I know Ohio State's going to get about 95% of the preseason number one votes when they come out. But there's going to be someone that says, you know what, I'm not just going to be a, a, a cow in the herd and, and go along for the ride. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go outside the box a little bit. So I think an SEC team will get at least one vote for number one in the AP poll. Yeah, that's – and that's – I mean, you, you've you kind of studied this over time. Is that – is this geographically based? I mean, if if you were to find out that there was one person that put Alabama or Auburn or Georgia atop the poll, what's the likelihood that one person would be a voter from one of those states? Uh, it'd be very strong that they'd be from the SEC country. And, you know, if you're an SEC uh, person, you still feel that you got the strongest conference in the country, which I think most people do. And you, you can poke holes in any team in the country out there. And I think you could talk yourself into a vote for one of those schools at number one. And let's keep in mind, you know, in Alabama, everybody's questioning what are they going to do at the quarterback position. Last year at this time, if you would have said Blake Sims is going to be the starting quarterback mm -hmm. for Alabama after that spring game he had last year, you'd be like wringing, uh, wringing towels, gnashing uh, teeth. You'd be like, oh, my goodness, there's no way. And here they were at the end of the season, number one in the country heading into the playoffs. So it's, it's one of those things where I think Alabama will find a quarterback or an Auburn Somebody's going to fall in love with them, and they get voted by by most likely someone from the SEC country. Yeah, the only difference with Alabama, Phil, is uh, it's not just the quarterback position. It's every uh, wide receiver that had any impact uh, on the field. It's a secondary in the defense that, quite frankly, wasn't great last year, and, and now they lose a lot of those guys as well. So it's, it's certainly deeper than just quarterback this time for them. Uh, it is, but you also have a team that's had the number one recruiting class five straight years, and, you know, uh, you look at they they lose themselves a, a outstanding running back and uh, T.J. Yeldon, but they've got back a running back who led the team in rushing last year and Derrick Henry, and he's got a couple of uh, top-notch guys behind him. And in the receiving core, I don't see an Amari Cooper on the roster, but there wasn't Amari Cooper on very many rosters last year. I think they've got a little bit better depth in the receiving core. You you go three deep in what I call VHTs. The offensive line would be my biggest question mark with this year's team. I think the defense is going to be stronger. The offensive line is a question mark. But they've done a good job rebuilding the offensive line in years past as well. In terms of SEC teams that may be ranked uh, either highly or get those first-place votes, uh, what would be the top three from this conference that would be the most likely to grab them? I think there's going to be three teams that are in the AP top ten, and those are the three teams who are most likely to get those first-place votes. Uh, number, The other one I, I give a strong possibility to is Auburn. You know, with Auburn, you know you're going to have the offense with Gus Malzahn as the head coach. They've got a quarterback that's been in games and done it. They've got tremendous running backs, receivers, offensive line. They're going to be explosive. And then defensively, they made some strides last year, but now they've got Will Muschamp on that side of the ball. They've got eight returning starters. And they've got a lot of what I call VHTs, or very highly touted players that they're plugging in. And uh, I think Auburn is going to be preseason top ten uh, right up there. And then the other one would be Georgia. And, you know, once again, Georgia's replacing their quarterback. But 
They were replacing their quarterback last year. They've got the best set of running backs in the country, one of the top offensive lines, outstanding receivers. And I think the defense shapes up pretty solid. My biggest question mark for Georgia is they draw both Alabama and Auburn out of the West this year. Yep. But really, they're a team that uh, could very well get there, and they finished number nine in the AP poll last year. I think this year's team won't have the injuries they had last year. Bill Steele. Bill, always good talking with you, whether it's on this show or Dari Mel or anywhere else. Thank you. Always good catching up with you, Dari. Thank you for listening to the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Tune into the Paul Feinbaum show every day from 3 to 7 Eastern on the SEC Network or on the ESPN Radio app. Two of baseball's best go head-to-head in interleague action when the Tigers head to St. Louis to face the Cardinals. A pregame at 7 Eastern, first pitch at 8, Sunday on ESPN and ESPN Radio.